gorgeous makeup loving friends welcome back to another video um this is a little bit different um it is start of a new sort of a series i want to do on my channel um as a lot of you know i am a psychologist more specifically i am an applied behavior analyst i am actually a board certified behavior analyst doctoral level uh, which i'm <laughs> frighteningly uh, proud of so my special speciality is actually in behavioral psychology but i have an interest in psychology overall um, obviously having gained my initial degree in psychology more generally. Um, this video is just a very very simple get ready with me where I do this face. I know it's so beautiful, it's so flawless, how can I even cope? Um, but I am actually answering some of the questions that you guys have posed to me in relation to psychology. Um, I guess I want to have like a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, obviously the uh, topics of mental health, depression um, and some sort of mention around um, self-harm do crop up in this video. So if you find that that may be difficult for you to listen to, this isn't the video for you. Um, and I don't want to put you into a position that it could be in any way triggering or harmful towards your mental health. This is not what this video is meant for. This is meant to essentially talk through psychology, ask the questions that you've always wanted to ask to a psychologist about the general theory, about um, the field. This is your opportunity. Um, it's just a very simple uh, video. If you like it, I am going to continue doing this about once a month, once every six weeks. So drop your questions down below if you have any ones that you would like me to answer for the next video. Uh, but essentially, yeah, that's it. That's what we're doing for this video. So keep on watching to see how I did this and to see what sort of questions I was asked and how I'm answering them. Strange to start filming and already be dressed, but I was like, Mm, I'll, I'll try. Um, so I'm going to start off first by just priming my eyelids. I am using the NYX HD Studio Photogenic um, Studio Concealer um, and we'll hop into the questions which is going to be fun because I can't really read. Um, <laughs> I want to have my glasses off so yeah enjoy that. Um, one of the first questions that I had was what could have possibly affected Boris Johnson and Donald Trump as a child? Now, I normally stay away from anything political on my channel because my job is as a lecturer in psychology, so I have to stay pretty neutral. Um, but I can kind of talk on this because it's more psychology based. Um, if we look at them, I think the, the big thing that we see there is the impact of culture and um, kind of finances and the impact of social class. So one of the big things we see there is they have no real idea what it's like to be working class. And like, that's great. Like, well done them that, you know, they're in that particular situation that they haven't had to struggle economically um, but it does mean that it's kind of impacted their perspective taking to a degree um, so that would be a big thing um, another major thing that I would say uh, excuse me I'm just like getting sellotape to try and fix my face um, another big thing that I think that we would see with them is that by virtue of them growing up in an economically advantaged situation, sorry for the sounds, um, they haven't been told no all that often. So they're not really used to not getting their own way. So that's something we kind of see them getting a bit belligerent with people who don't take the exact same stance as them. Um, so I think there kind of wasn't enough discipline in there early on to kind of teach them about limitations, etc. Um, because I am a big um, believer, I am a behavioral psychologist. So I really believe that the ways in which we are raised, the ways in which we are interacted with have a really long lasting impact upon us as we um, grow. That'll, that'll 
do ish right not even doing anything wildly precise am i who knows who knows um so i think there's a certain amount of that going on now there's some really interesting theories out there if you look at the likes of trump uh one of my favorites is um Oh God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Um, is that he has tertiary syphilis? <laughs> um, because syphilis, once it gets towards its final stages, it starts to impact the brain and starts to impact decision making, etc. So some people kind of think that that's what's going on. I'm going. I am using this um, Morphe Boss Mood Palette, which was gifted to me for my birthday by the beautiful. Jenny or as we all know her princess Jenny um, and I have kind of been looking at this for quite some time and she so so kindly gifted this to me for my birthday so I'm going into this shade here it's very difficult to hold this up at an angle uh, there you go so yeah one of my favorites is saying that he potentially has by the way I'm using the um, Jessup 233 cream shader probably not appropriate but whatever I'm not going for anything wild today um, one of my favorites is is around that and thinking that hey maybe uh, what's going on here is that actually you know his brain is damaged as a result of uh, an std and that is impacting his choices so i'm not saying that that's what it is but there are some theories around that and i think it's quite funny and um actually we, we gain a lot of our understanding about um what do you call it about the brain and the way that it works from um kind of people who have brain damage <laughs> so just fyi that's that's where some people are coming from on that um there of course are people that would maintain that there is components of a narcissistic personality disorder um but in saying that you can't say that something happened to somebody to bring that about that is uh more of like a genetic predisposition and actually if you look at well not so much Forrest because if you look at his siblings they appear to be a little bit more I don't want to say well adjusted <laughs> but they don't seem to exhibit the same mm, flaws in judgment as uh, their brother Boris um, his father is definitely quite eccentric so there is that so there does seem to be possibly a genetic thing if we look at the likes of trump his father seems to have been very oh god how do i say this without like <laughs> inciting a riot um i'm taking the jessup 228 lux crease and i am going into this green here I can do what I like. Why not? It's my party. I can do what I like. Um, oh god, who knows what I'm doing. Um, but he seemed to have kind of shown some issues around that. If you look at um some of the dealings of his grandfather, and you know, he was quite ruthless in terms of his acquisition of his fortune. Um, you know, you could be forgiven in thinking that maybe there's some amount of mm, an antisocial personality disorder in the sense of there being like sociopathy of not minding if you screw somebody over as long as it benefits you in the long term not saying that that's what he has but there's there's some indications there and again we do know that there's a, a genetic predisposition for that and when you look at his grandfather there seems to be some Kind of traits along that you know hashtag just saying um but essentially to answer that question of what is it that happened to uh donald trump and boris johnson to make them be the way that they are um it's a it seems to be a blend of both biological um stuff so their genetics but also you know they were put into a great position of um privilege and they just don't see what the rest of us see, essentially. Um, we really saw that with Boris Johnson and his speech about staying alert and uh, 
really not understanding how public transport works. Like, um, that's a nice virus, but have you ever been on a bus? Do, do you know how this works? Also, sorry for the big spot on my face. Like, it's, um, I was basically growing another head and I popped it. It was a whole thing, but uh, it's healing pretty well. Um, so, yeah, this is looking very bruised, isn't it? Whatever. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's happening. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, what was my next question? I, do I have to? Yeah, glasses. There we go. Why are parents mean to their children? Now, please note that when I'm giving responses to these, they're very generic. They're not based on your case or the cases of others, because I don't know enough information on that to kind of go into anything wildly in depth. Okay. So, you know, anything I speak on, it is just going to be quite, um, not vague, but broad. So there can be a lot of reasons as to why parents may be mean or may not show affection to their children in the way that we would maybe typically expect them to. So one of the big things that we know, I'm going, by the way, into my um, cream shader again, the, and I'm going back into that dark shade again. Uh, one of the things that we know is obviously we learn how to um, relate to people based upon um, our early childhood and the relationships that we form with our parents. And actually, the way that our parents parent us can impact the way that we parent our children. So one of the reasons that a parent may exhibit those behaviours is that that's how they were parented. That's literally how they were parented. And as far as they're concerned, that's just how you parent. That's that's the norm. Um, so that that can be a factor in that. Um, another thing can be um, around, you know, if there's a, a present psychological disorder, you know, um, things like if somebody has a, like a mood disorder, they can be far more um, frustrated or agitated or angry in terms of how they're dealing with loved ones. Um, so there could be an element of, of that in there. There could also be an element of jealousy. Again, everything I'm saying is like, it's very, I don't really know because I, I don't know what those exact situations are. So bear with me. Um, I'm taking this Juvia's Place brush. It's very big. And I'm going into um, this shade here. Just doing a very, very basic look today. I'm just, I'm lazy. Um, but it could be that even they may have an underlying psychological disorder themselves. Um, but they don't really know how to relate to other people. They could have, you know, um, like a, a social processing disorder that they don't really know that maybe, you know, being harsh on your children is not the appropriate way to do these things. You could also be looking at somebody who has a narcissistic personality and they view their children as being an extension of themselves. And therefore, when they don't do the things that they feel that they should be doing, they see it as poorly reflecting on themselves rather than seeing their child as being an independent um, individual who, you know, should be able to do their own thing. Um, so that that could be a certain amount of it. Again, I'm taking this um, Jessup brush. Uh, I'm not taking anything on it and I'm just going to blend. So there could be a certain amount of jealousy there or anger or frustration that somebody isn't kind of behaving in the exact way that they want them to. But of course, human beings are individual. They should ultimately do whatever it is that suits them. But yeah, I mean, as, as I'm sure you can tell, it's a very complex um, area and it's not easy to kind of say that there's any one particular thing it could be the way that they themselves are raised it could be that they have their own issues um, and then of course there can be just a sheer clash in personalities amongst uh, or between kids and and their parents you know 
like a parent can love their child but they can still find that they're being wound up by them um so it's it's yeah it's it's, it's a tricky one to kind of say exactly what's going on there so the next question then that I had was what information could you give for living with a gifted child um that is a tricky enough question um the thing is sometimes with gifted children you sometimes see um a co-occurrence of behavioral disorders because oftentimes they aren't stimulated by their environment i.e they are bored um kind of half thinking I should have kept the damned tape on because I'm going to try and do liner so I'm going to be quiet now I'm not going to answer any questions I'm just going to try and do this because there's only so much I can find to do have I potentially ruined that yeah probably I mean that'll do um and you see it's a transformer so it's in the shade fuse so it should come out to be a sort of a green it's kind of cool um back to answering the damned question <laughs> um so in terms of advice because kids have a tendency um who are very bright to um get quite bored my advice is to try and find activities that are actually um pitched at a cognitive level that's appropriate to them so even though they may be say five or six years old they may actually be cognitively um far more advanced than that so you may want to pitch something to them that is more you know for a 10 or 11 year old uh, depending upon you know what the advice is I would also say um, follow their interests if they are interested in say for instance something like dinosaurs then you know get them books and information on um, you know the megalithic period and not the megalithic period but the jurassic period and all of the bits and pieces on that and you know maybe have them do projects in ireland we have a thing called the ctyi which is the center for talented youth of ireland so they do like workshops and stuff for the week over the weekend to see how like tiny my lashes are like they're not existent at all don't worry i'm gonna put actual false lashes on because that's just that's just sad you know um but they do like a thing where they do like writing workshops and stuff with kids so kind of things like that can be really useful where they can meet peers and they can um they do like science classes etc so keep an eye out for something like that that might be uh, fitted towards them i'd also say um try and put them towards some extracurricular activities that could be really good for them as well um just to keep them engaged um but i would also say that just because they're cognitively um a little bit more advanced you still have to remember that they are kids so make sure that you know you are still communicating with them in an appropriate way because uh, sometimes you can kind of forget and talk to them like they're adults and that's just not really fair because they still deserve a childhood so it's very much a fine line what i would say is just always kind of chat with them about how they're feeling and what they would like and what they would appreciate because sometimes they can just give you the information that they need to essentially excel um what i'm going to do now is just put on uh some lashes i'm going to do that off camera because otherwise <laughs> you're going to be bored silly and i'll see you back for the rest of the questions because there's quite a few i'm back the lashes are on i'll zoom you in so you can kind of see it it's a very very simple look oh by the way i have the earrings on that rebecca got me for my birthday thank you i'm feeling very fancy so it's a super super simple look it's sort of like a fox eye but with color <laughs> um i didn't really want to do too much today because uh, i'm lazy i'll take off the glasses and kind of see it a bit better it's like hyper simple hyper hyper simple so we'll just get on to the next bit, which is essentially me just uh, priming my skin. Nothing nothing wild or exciting there. I am using Benefit That Gal. Uh, the next uh, question that I had was, can being born with a cord wrapped around a neck uh, bring about autism? No. Um, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So uh, there is evidence that suggests that um, autism is present from essentially conception because uh, there's some data that shows that the cranium within uterus is a little bit larger of somebody with autism so that suggests 
that you have it before you are actually born. So anything that happens during labor um, is unlikely to bring about autism. Now, what having a cord wrapped around your neck can do is it can deprive the brain of oxygen, which can actually lead to a traumatic brain injury, um, which can result in deficits in uh, various aspects of cognition. So it wouldn't be autism, but you could have some deficits depending upon what parts of the brain are deprived of oxygen. That's that's my my um my response on that. I'm gonna take um benefit what's up and I'm just gonna pop it. I like to pop it just under here. Around here, because it gives a little bit of a glow. And it's uh too dark for me otherwise you see. I uh there is some sort of attempt at logic. I have uh the Urban Decay colour correcting here so I'm going to I mean I have horrific spots these days I think it's just stress there we go in you go so I'm gonna get on to my next question because it's almost into an autism theme here which I'm well you see I obviously I section the questions in such a way that it would be logical for me to talk about these um are you more likely to be diagnosed with autism now uh than say in the last 20 to 30 years yeah you would um part of the reason around that is not necessarily oh autism is more prevalent i'm just using my hourglass foundation and towards the end of it oh, mom i'll get you um but part of why we're seeing an increase in prevalence is we are getting better at our diagnostics. So in 1994, we had the DSM-4, which is our previous diagnostics manual um, to diagnose various disorders, including um, autism. And actually in the 1994 iteration, that was where we had Asperger's, right? Asperger's became a diagnostic label. But in 2013, they revised it. So they got rid of Asperger's as being a diagnostic label and they actually changed some of the uh, criteria around being uh, diagnosed with autism before it had been considered to be a triad of impairments and then it moved to being a dyad of impairments. Now what happened when they moved that was it became more sensitive and more specific as a measure so it was better able to detect people who had autism who had gone uh, without a, a diagnosis beforehand. So you're more likely to get diagnosed with autism now because the um, the measures are far more able to, and, and sensitive at picking these particular things up. God, I'm very much near the end of that. Just trying to get what little is left of that foundation because I do actually really enjoy it. Uh, it's also part of my project plan. So if you've been watching my project plan, you're also going to be like, oh, she's going to have some things for this month. Yes, I am. Um, so yeah, basically, you are more likely to get diagnosed with autism. No, it is not because of chemtrails or vaccines or anything like that. It just, it's just forget. We're, we're understanding how to diagnose and pick these things up better than we were in the past. Let's see, how does that look? Yeah. And I've kind of filled that in a certain amount doesn't look quite so bad. I really like the finish on that particular foundation, it really suits me. Um, next one is, uh, what's the difference between dyspraxia and autism? <clears throat> so what I will say is, by the way, I'm going in with, I think just a smidge of uh, the It Cosmetics CC Illumination Cream in the shade Fair, just to give an extra little nothing much. Uh, what I will say is if you have autism, it's highly unlikely that you will just have autism. Usually autism is also diagnosed along with something else such as anxiety or something like dyspraxia. Where, where autism and dyspraxia are different is um, that dyspraxia is primarily a movement disorder, so an issue around gross motor movements. 
we do actually see that sometimes with individuals with autism. So if you're looking at like really early diagnostics um, from um, say the POM, so the parental observation of early marker scale, or the biscuit, which is the baby and infant uh, screen for autistic uh, traits, some of the things that they would pick up on would be things like walking on your tippy toes or unusual gait. So dyspraxia, it is essentially just, well, I say just, it is a movement disorder. Um, so around things like gross motor and even fine motor um, things, and, and it can also affect uh, some of your developmental milestones. Whereas if you look at um, autism, it is um, a social, primarily a social and communication disorder, uh, not so much focused around um, movements. So that's kind of where the big difference lies there. Um, I'm just going to take a concealer brush. Um, it is my Sigma F70 and I'm going to go into my NARS concealer. Um, the next question then was how might um, missing out on a diagnosis um, affect somebody? Uh, and this, by the way, because I was asked this for both autism and for ADHD, and there's kind of some overlap because again, if you have uh, autism, you're far more likely to have um, to exhibit traits of um, ADHD. There just seems to be a big kind of correlation there. So, I mean, the biggest thing is if you aren't diagnosed is you don't get the supports and the supports aren't there just for the fun. The supports are there to help people reach their full potential and to give them kind of an equal footing uh, with people who don't have the same difficulties in, for instance, attending to, to things, understanding the social cues, etc. Um, if you aren't given that particular opportunity uh, to engage in those supports, it can ultimately impact not just how you're doing academically, but how you're doing socially. It can impact things like your self-esteem, um, which can, of course, then impact things like uh, your development of depression later on. So the, the impact of these things kind of can't be understated. That it is it is pretty big. I'm taking um, this um, Real Techniques based shadow brush and I'm just going into some Laura Mercier powder. I don't use a huge amount and I'm just going to pop it there just to kind of keep the concealer in place. Like I said, I'm not doing anything wild or amazing today. I'm very lazy. Very, very lazy. That'll do. And. <clears throat> What was the next question? Uh, yes, uh, info on having a partner with autism, how does it affect relationships? Um, whether or not you've been diagnosed and whether you've gotten support, that, that does impact things. So if you have been diagnosed and you've gotten support, um, your issues around relationships don't tend to be quite as big, but if you haven't gotten a diagnosis and haven't, um, gotten the support it's much more difficult to engage in things like perspective taking um, understanding body language for example so women are the worst for this you know we are really bad for saying oh I'm fine when newsflash we're not and the thing is if you have a, a, a social communication disorder where you are straight away at a disadvantage in terms of uh, you know understanding that words do not necessarily equate to that to that which is said you're going to think that somebody is actually fine and it can lead to a lot of resentment uh, on both sides where one person saying well you told me that you were fine so of course i didn't do this or of course i didn't say this and um the other person may have expectations around their behavior. Um, a lot of people seem to think that um, individuals with autism do not have empathy. They do, they absolutely 100% do. Um, people with autism do have empathy. They just aren't 100% certain about how to express it. Um, so uh, an example of this might be um, 
a friend of mine is on the spectrum and when my brother died we were all at the funeral and she could see I was upset and her reaction was oh we have to go and get some noms noms now noms and I understood exactly what that meant for her that was her kind of saying I see that you're upset the way that I deal with being upset is going and, and seeking comfort and food so she was like I'm trying to help you uh, some people kind of thought that was unusual or strange but it was her trying to pick up on the particular situation and it was just so sweet of her um, but the ability to to pick up on these social cues can really impact things and it can lead to resentment on both sides of 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 the whole thing um, you also find with individuals with autism they can also have a sensory processing disorder so they can struggle a lot with touch so there's some research that says that say light touch is miscommunicated via the nerve receptors in an individual with autism so that they don't perceive it as being a light touch but they might receive it as being gripped so it's actually really um highly uncomfortable for them so things like being intimate or cuddling uh, those physical gestures of love could be a little bit more difficult but you could simultaneously find somebody with autism who absolutely loves being very physically demonstrative of their affection and maybe may not know when they maybe should kind of calm <laughs> um, and when is the appropriate time or not to to engage in these particular things so my main takeaway from that is it very much depends upon the person because autism varies across people that's why it's called autism spectrum disorder um, because everyone is kind of going to manifest a little bit differently um, and by the way taking um, my color pop um, super shock cheek in the shade i think it's on the cusp i use this an awful lot it is really nice and if you apply it with um, a sponge it gives a really nice sort of a finish in in my opinion but you don't really want my opinion do you um let me see what is what is the next one um advice on a dating with severe anxiety yeah i mean <laughs> dating is hard let let's be real i'm a single woman so i'm like girl or boy i've got you i know how, how difficult this actually is um i'm just gonna take a little bit of stuff to put through my brows i'm so lazy uh Anne marie did recently give me like hair soap to do soap brows and i'm like i am not brave enough to do this i'm gonna wait for um amanda to come over uh, once all of this weird lockdown stuff is done and she's gonna do uh soap brows on my channel so looking forward to that um but in terms of advice uh if you have a uh, severe anxiety um that's that's a tricky one because again anxiety can manifest very very differently um towards people i'm just taking this um color pop cream blush it's in um, drop of a hat it's really nice it's kind of an orangey so taking it on a sponge um what i would say whoo that is pigmented i always forget how pigmented that is um i mean dating is a is a very tricky one because you kind of do have to have a certain amount of anxiety around it because you are putting yourself into a very vulnerable situation and i think particularly for women we do have to be anxious if we if we aren't anxious you know we, we let our guards down and things can happen not necessarily positive things um in terms of decreasing your anxiety i would say um you know there, there are good like dating agencies they may be good because they take a certain amount of the pressure off of things they cost money don't get me wrong but it might be worth going towards that um if you're nervous of like how to socially interact or what it is that you want to say on dates you can always have topics uh, built up 
um, as sort of icebreakers, etc. That can sometimes be kind of helpful. Um, but it, it's difficult to kind of give advice in terms of dating. I would always say, do not drink if you are on a first date in particular, uh, because you do still need to have your guard up to an extent. I am, by the way, using Anastasia Beverly Hills uh, Stick Foundation in the shade Mink. I'm just kind of putting it in places where I need to pretend I'm a bit more chiseled. Um, but you, I would say don't drink either because it also kind of, that is a depressant and it can actually make your anxiety a lot worse. Um, you want to be fairly sharp if you're on a date. The other thing I would actually say is if you're going on a date with somebody, tell them you're nervous, you know? Um, and you know what, if you slip up, if you make a few boo-boos, that's okay. You know, it's, you're a human being, don't be too harsh on yourself. Um, I would say you have to engage in self-care um, before and after you go out, um, you know, um, if you are dating, by the way, wear red. There's loads of studies to show that it seems to have a very um, specific effect on people. So yeah, I know that's very, very broad advice, um, but that's kind of all I can really say on that. Um, how can someone overcome anxiety to do things alone? Which is a really, really good question. The thing is, you have to break it down into sections. So obviously your end goal is to do things alone. Um, but there's a big step between doing things by yourself, such as going to the gym by yourself and maybe going in a group, etc. So what I would say is start off with people that you're comfortable with um, and uh, say maybe go in a duo or a trio to do this particular thing. So going for a walk by yourself, going to the gym by yourself, uh, like not by yourself, but with these particular people um, so that you're decreasing the amount of people you're with and kind of, we would call it sort of graduated exposure where you're slowly but surely getting used to a slightly more stressful situation in terms of getting used to doing something by yourself. It doesn't have to be a whole hour long session. It doesn't have to be a whole hour long walk. It can literally be going out for a walk for five minutes by yourself. That's fine. Do that and, and do that several times until you start to feel comfortable with that. And then up it. Up it as to, you know, the duration that you're going for a walk. Um, maybe, you know, the distance that you're going by yourself. The, the important thing is to look at your end goal and essentially structure it into more bite-sized manageable things um, if you're anxious about going by yourself you can even um, you know FaceTime with somebody or chat with somebody on the phone so that you're not 100% by yourself so that can be another way of doing those particular things um, how what can you do to uh, keep anxiety down during lockdown oh sweet merciful Zeus is this ever a, a thing to talk about um, let's face it I Anxiety is, I would say, at an all-time high for a lot of people, myself included. I do have a diagnosed anxiety disorder. I'm pretty open about these things. I'm not embarrassed about it. It is what it is. Um, one of the things I would say is, by the way, I'm, I'm going in with a, an Ofer brush into the number seven um, pressed powder translucent. Um, one of the things I would say is actually plugging into media um, so such as news, radio, etc., on a consistent basis. And even things like social media can actually be quite damaging because there's a lot of misinformation on there and there's a lot of negativity. So what I would say is kind of decrease the amount of time that you're spending based on those particular things. Make sure that you're eating right. We know that, um, you know, an appropriate balance of fruit, veg, etc., does impact you mentally um some exercise always good like i mean <laughs> that's just a standard one to 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 say um what else um just because we're meant to be social distancing that does not mean that you are in isolation keep in contact with people do zoom parties uh, chat with people and i think rather importantly engage in self-care so if it's you know taking time to just sit out in the garden and um you know have a cup of tea uh, put on a face mask whatever it is do that and you know what if you're feeling miserable that's okay 
those feelings are totally valid. Don't beat yourself up because you're feeling miserable or you're feeling anxious about all of this because the thing is, it's a very unique situation and your feelings are totally valid. You know, don't, don't beat yourself up about that. I mean, that's looking okay. Uh, that's my my main advice on that. Um, opposite reactions than what you'd expect for anxiety, uh, such as going to the gym more. What do I have to say on that? That's actually pretty darn common. This is um, when people have an issue around uh, control. So anxiety can often manifest because you feel that you have no control over your environment. So people may, for instance, go to the gym far more if they're put into an anxious situation, um, which isn't actually healthy. You know, um, we also see, for instance, people who have eating disorders, that's often a manifestation of an anxiety and an issue around control and they control what they are eating and what they are putting into their bodies or not putting into their bodies. So I would actually say it, it, it can be quite harmful because obviously if you over exercise, that is not good for you. Um, puts a lot of strain on the cardiovascular system, on uh, your or, uh, on your muscle muscles, on your musculature. Um, not that I know much about that, but actually I did. I used to exercise like a huge amount, and I totally took it too far at times. Um, so I think if, if you are doing that, you have to recognise that you're doing that, and not stop yourself, but try and understand maybe why you're doing what you're doing and figure out what your source of anxiety is. Um, if it's, for instance, current lockdown, there's not a lot that you can do about it, but sometimes the source of our, of our anxiety can actually be um, addressed. I am using uh, the Sigma Large Angle Contour, it's the F40, and I'm going into the Hourglass Bronzer. It's the Luminous Bronze Light. Um, Okay, so the next thing I have is, do I have OCD? Things have to be a certain way or my anxiety is triggered. Um, OCD is, of course, um, an anxiety disorder. Um, I can't diagnose OCD partly because I am not a clinical psychologist. That is not my training. Um, and you have to obviously sit down and do proper assessment with somebody in order to determine whether or not they have OCD. There are very particular uh, criteria around that but the important thing is the obsessive compulsive thing around that. So uh, that you are obsessively doing something and you can't not do it uh, and uh, there is a compulsion to engage in this thing and it's often um, uh, paired with a feeling of impending doom. So some people will say who have um, OCD that they feel, for instance, that they have to um, turn a light on and off 20 times, otherwise a, a, a beloved family member will die, right? It is this compulsion um, around these particular, like in general, we would think that um, a traditional one might be excessive hand washing and the fear is contamination fear that a loved one will die but it's in excess of what is happening in the environment obviously now in the environment that we're in it's like no that's a legitimate concern you know um so i, I am interested just in the phrasing of that of saying it triggers anxiety and um, ocd being essentially characterized as an anxiety disorder i mean i th if you think that you have it it would be worth talking to somebody about um uh, because ocd is very debilitating it it's not fun and it's not quirky and it's not like oh i just like to have things a certain way it it's really really severe and um it really impacts people's lives um so if you do think you have it i would say go ahead and see about you know getting a diagnosis or an assessment um i can't do that for you unfortunately that just i'm I, i'm not practicing outside the confines of my ability um what do i think of uh, the behavior of focusing on a topic and obsessing over it um that that's an interesting one because that kind of rounds back to things like um autism um because one of the um criteria around that is perseverative interest so kind of being a like obsessed over something and just wanting to talk about it all the time or, or looking at it all the time. Um, 
in certain jobs, obviously, it's very, very handy. In my job as an academic, you kind of need to be able to obsess over things for a long period of time. And what's interesting is we actually see there's data that shows that academics, people who are high up in those particular ranks, are more likely to show symptoms of uh, autism than the general population. Um, and obviously, like certain companies like Silicon Valley, et cetera, are out and out looking for people who are able to um, attend to detail and are kind of, you know, interested in the nitty gritty of something. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but if it's getting in the way of, for instance, your day to day and you're forgetting to eat, you're forgetting to sleep, you're forgetting to interact with people, then that's that's a thing um how do i stop overthinking things i think that the first thing is just recognizing what you're doing um so in order to stop it you have to recognize the patterns and what's happening what are the things that triggers you overthinking a situation um and you have to try and find replacement behaviors so if you're overthinking something maybe you actually just need to talk to somebody about it i know that seems super super simple but sometimes you do actually just need to Get it out there into the universe and talk to somebody and somebody can kind of, I don't want to say talk you down, but they can kind of calm you down and give you a different perspective. Um, I would also say sometimes measure the amount of time that you're you're spending overthinking and, and look towards decreasing it so you can see whether or not some, this particular measure is working. Um, I am taking like a little buff brush and I'm going into the unnamed blush I'm nearly there like I'm nearly finished um I'm really taking my time on this it's a very simple look but you know why not um how can mental health affect your physical health oh my lord um it really really affects things um cortisol uh, for example if you are highly stressed that impacts um the, like that's obviously impacts your physiology it impacts your waking cycle it impacts your mental health overall um if you are stressed over a period of time that impacts your cardiovascular health so it actually impacts your your blood pressure again your sleep cycle sleep apnea um we we know that things like if you go through a very severe loss actually it impacts your your white cell count um so the, the things that we're going through psychologically and mentally, excuse me, actually impact us on a very, very physical level uh, to the point that you're more prone to um, catch communicable diseases. So if you are, you know, if your mental health is not great, your actual physical health isn't likely to be very good either you you're also more likely then to focus upon um any physical ailments if you're down and then that makes you more down and you end up in a sort of a cycle so it is actually pretty huge um i'm just gonna take my nyx dewy finish and uh spray my face was that enough who knows who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm after getting a chunk of it into my mouth because I'm an idiot. Um, how how does having someone uh, with depression in house impact people, and how do you combat it? I mean, there's absolutely no denying that if you have somebody in your home that has depression, it totally impacts you because we we are not islands as much as we might like to think it. I'm using the benefit cookie. Um, and other people's behavior totally impacts us. Um, they can be modeling kind of depressive behavior to us and that can put us into a down mood. Or if they're saying a lot of negative things, it is more likely then to prime us to feel more anxious and to feel depressed. Um, of course, then you can also feel quite inadequate of, um, <clears throat> this is somebody I really care about and I can't get them to not feel sad am i not good enough so it, it actually has like really big repercussions and of course it impacts uh people's mental health um in terms of you know stressing about somebody else and how they're feeling and just hoping that they're okay um uh, in terms of how to combat it um there are support groups for this sort of thing and i would say as always talking about these things is really 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 important i know it's so cliched but it genuinely does help. Um, that would be my, oh God, I'm, 
I'm very, very glowy there. That would be my major piece of advice around that. Whew. I'm going to have to like fix my fringe. It's doing strange things. Um, next question. Depression. Is it permanent and will I ever be myself again? Here's the thing. Uh, depression's prevalence, uh, so in terms of how likely it is to last long term, is fairly high. Okay. It's sort of like having diabetes. Okay. You're, you're always going to have that vulnerability towards being depressed. You know, it sucks. I'm, I'm one of those people. Um, but essentially, um, I'm just taking a Huda Demi Matte liquid lipstick in the shade Medusa. I won't do it yet. I'm going to wait till I answer the question, but I'm just going to show it to you. Um, my essential answer is yes, you will eventually end up feeling not depressed again. Now, the thing is, it's a journey to get there uh, because psychological health is a battle that it's not easily one uh there's a lot of time uh, and effort that goes into these things whether it's using cbt whether it's using act dialectical behavior therapy um if you say something with borderline personality disorder which often is accompanied with depression um it may be a matter of getting medications correct um understanding that certain things can trigger these things and and making sure that you're not put into compromising situations that could harm your mental health um, you will find you are still going to have down days because you're a human and that's kind of how it is. Um, I hate to quote Ronan Keating, but life is a roller coaster. It's going to go up, it's going to go down. You're going to have really great days and you're going to have really rubbish days and you're going to have a lot of meh days in between. Um, so you're never going to not have depression. It's always going to be on your card in the same way that somebody who has diabetes is always going to have diabetes. But if you engage in the correct things, you will manage it and be able to be like people who don't have that diagnosis and don't have that disorder. So hope that generally makes sense. Um, the next one is, a, is a, well, this is by the way, the last one. So my partner eats a lot to a point where he will feel sick. I have to hide food from him or try to ration it out. So I'm not missing out. I often feel I have to eat my food quickly or he will steal it off my plate. How do I approach him with this? Is this food addiction? Again, this could be a control, again, like I can't diagnose, um, but this could be an issue of control manifesting itself that this could be somebody trying to control their environment or it could be a manifestation of an anxiety disorder because you have to understand that food gives a very specific physiological reaction and um, it's quite meaningful and there's a reason why we comfort eat. So if you're actually having to ration food that is quite concerning and uh, I'm wondering if there's also um, an accompaniment of anger frustration if somebody is prevented from engaging and getting their food that that could be a thing um i i can't really say much on that there is um there is a society called overeaters anonymous and it's for people who um kind of are overeating essentially that may be something to liaise with um in terms of approaching it it can be a very delicate thing Let, let's be real um communication being important and ensuring that you're saying that this is coming from a place of love and concern not a place of judgment um i think that's quite important but it is something that would need to be talked about um but i can't give any huge advice on that because again i'm not really privy to exactly what's going on uh but that's it those are the questions i'm going to put on medusa now which sounds a bit wrong but uh there you go So that is, that is it, that is. It. 
so that is it that is our whole uh get ready with me ask me anything i did a very very simple look um nothing really to write home about i want to do these a little bit more often um about once a month maybe once every six weeks so uh under this video if you are interested put some of your questions down below um i answered quite a like all of the ones that were asked to me as far as i know i may have left out some i hope i didn't um but yeah, uh, that, that's it. Do please like, comment and subscribe. Uh, do please share because sharing is caring unless of course it's an STD, in which case, you know, gross. Keep it in your pants. Like, there's super gonorrhea out there because of people like you. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but that is it and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye. <laughs>